of the then threatening war and would have made possible the continuation under the duress which this weapon would have made possible of the working agreement involving France, Germany, and Britain to maintain the status quo in Europe. When Chamberlain failed at the Munich conference to retain this state of European equilibrium, it was necessary to get rid of Chamberlain and install a new prime minister the effort to shift one corner of the triangle from Germany to Russia. Baldwin found no virtue in Test's plan and, pre and peremptorily ended negotiations. However, there is a large looming problem over hovering over these assertions, and that is simply the sequence of historical facts. Neville Chamberlain remained prime minister until the Nazi invasion of the Low Countries and France in May of 1940, and did not, as is alleged, step aside for Stanley Irwin to return to Britain's premiership after the Munich Conference of 1938. In fact, Chamberlain remained, and even after Churchill had replaced him, on Churchill's war cabinet until his death a few months later from cancer. The entire sequence of events is wrong. For it was Chamberlain who had replaced Baldwin as Prime Minister in 1937, and in any case, it is unlikely that Chamberlain, who per pursued a policy of appeasement with Germany, would have been interested in a weapon of mass destruction that, had the Germans caught wind of the plan as they inevitably would have, would have exacerbated tensions between the two nations even more. But need one discard these actions merely for the presence of this admittedly whopping historical mistake? Perhaps not, for it is possible that O'Neill is simply recording accurately what Tesla told him, and Tesla, then already a very old man, might have not remembered things in their precise sequence, using Chamberlain with ball. On this reading, admittedly only a possibility, Tesla's deal was being negotiated with Stanley Baldwin, and the deal was subsequently scrubbed by Chamberlain on his assumption of the premiership and in the interest of appeasement. All this is mentioned because, of course, there is one country conspicuously absent from the previous roll call of countries involved with death ray research in the 1920s, Germany. However, as researcher Oliver Nicholson observes, the Germans were indeed working on such a weapon for the Chicago Tribune reported the following interesting little story. Berlin, that the German government has an invention of death rays that will bring down airplanes, halt tanks on the battlefields, ruin automobile murders, motors, <laughs> murders, and spread a curtain of death like the gas clouds of the recent war was the information given to Reichstag members by Herr Wuhl, chief of the militarist in that body. It is learned that three inventions have been perfected in Germany for the same purpose and have been patented. Self-evidently, such stories abounded in the 1920s in the wake of Tesla's pronouncements, but there are some sound reasons to take them seriously, especially in the case of Germany. Under the terms of the Versailles Treaty, Germany was prohibited from development of heavy artillery Germany was prohibited from development of heavy artillery over certain calibers, and absolutely prohibited from having tanks or even an air force, and its standing army was limited to a mere 100,000 men. However, the treaty did not prohibit development of these types of weapons, and thus it is logical to assume that Germany in particular would seek to do a technological end run around the restrictions of the treaty. Even more interesting, however, is the fact that Nicholson reports that one British researcher allegedly involved in the development of such systems, J. H. Hamill, observed that German system was based on an entirely different principle than those in evidence in other reports. While Hamill explicitly states that his own death ray is based on Tesla's Colorado Springs wireless power transmission experiments, it is also interesting that it appears that he misinterpreted the nature of those experiments, for he built a large Tesla coil and was apparently attempting to beam power by its means through the atmosphere, the exact opposite, it will be recalled, of what Tesla was trying to do. This makes his statements all that much more interesting, for by pursuing an entirely different principle, were the Germans in fact using the earth as a transmitter and the atmosphere as the ground, as Tesla himself indicated, we will never know. But it is interesting to note that whatever they were doing, it was not the same as what everyone else was doing, according to Hamill.
You've been listening to Babylon's Banksters, Interest and Suppression, presented by Hakim Ali Bokis Alexander on Spreaker, Social Podcasting, and Wisdom, Social Audio, presented for World Reading Club in association with Uniquilibrium. This edition's reading focus has come to us from Babylon's Banksters, The Alchemy of Deep Physics, High Finance, and Ancient Religions by Joseph P. Farrell. This is only part way into this section of the book, and I will return to it in not too long to complete it.